Welcome back to my video series where we go through every single option in Betaflight 4.3 configurator so you know what it is, what it does, and how to set it up when you encounter it yourself. This is video number six in the series where we are going to go through the Betaflight configuration tab. If that's what you're here for, then stick around. But if you want to watch the whole series, there's a link in the video description to the playlist, and you should probably start with number one and just work your way through. On to the configuration tab. And let's start up here in the upper left with the gyro update frequency and the PID loop frequency. So on your flight controller, there is a chip that has the gyro sensor and the accelerometer sensor. And uh, if we go back to the setup tab, the gyro sensor is what tells the flight controller when it is rotating and how fast it is rotating. And the accelerometer tells the flight controller which direction is up because gravity is an acceleration. That's not all the accelerometer does, but that, that's basically its main job on a flight controller. Um, and that chip is sampled at a certain rate. Uh, and that rate is a function of the designer of the chip. Most of the chips that we use in Betaflight flight controllers are sampled at up to eight kilohertz, 8,000 times per second. And in previous versions of Betaflight, it was possible to set the gyro update frequency to a number that was less than the what they call the native sampling rate of the gyro. So uh, for the ICM 2000 series gyros and the MPU 6000 series gyros that are used on many flight controllers, the native gyro sampling rate is eight kilohertz. That is what the manufacturer has sort of designed them to work the best at. And if you choose to sample them slower, there are some uh, implications. It causes some artifacting in the data, which can have negative effects on the flight controller's ability to fly well. So the Betaflight devs have decided that the best way to get a good flying quadcopter is to not let you change the gyro update frequency. And you can see here, there's no pull down. It's just locked at eight kilohertz. That's the native gyro sampling rate of the gyro chip that's on this board. And there's nothing I can do to change that. Now, most people watching this video are gonna see eight kilohertz as their gyro update frequency. Take a look at this slide from Chris Rosser's video about the different gyros that are used in flight controllers. It's a pretty deep dive, but if you wanna check it out, I'll put a link in the video description. It seems like the respectful thing to do. He shows the commonly used gyro chips and their output data rate. And notice that almost all of them are eight kilohertz, except for this one, the BMI 270, which outputs at 3.2 kilohertz. And the only reason I point that out is that here in 2022, it is getting harder and harder to get those other gyro chips. They're getting more and more expensive and manufacturers are moving to the BMI 270 gyro, which is at least as of today, less expensive. And so I point that out because in the future, more and more people are gonna see 3.2 kilohertz here instead of eight kilohertz and wonder whether the, you know, what that means. The fact is it doesn't mean anything because there's nothing you can do short of buying a different flight controller to change that number. But the good news is that the flight performance of the BMI 270 gyro, even though it has a lower sampling rate, is basically the same as the flight performance of the other gyros with their 8K sampling rate. So that's the gyro update frequency. What about the PID loop frequency? Betaflight's code runs in a repetitive loop. Every loop, it calculates uh, what the gyro and other sensors are telling the flight controller that the quadcopter is doing, like how it's physically moving in space. It calculates what the sticks are commanding the quadcopter to do, and then it uses the PID controller, the PID controller, uh, to determine what the motors should do to make the quadcopter fly right. And that just happens repeatedly. Every time we go through the PID loop, we calculate a new output for the motors, and then that just makes the quadcopter fly. And the PID loop by default happens at the same rate as the gyro update frequency. So we can see 8K here and 8K here. It is possible to run the PID loop slower than the gyro update frequency. And the main reason you would want to do that would be if your CPU load was too high. Now, way back in video number one of this series, we talked about this CPU load indicator and what too high might be. So again, there's a playlist down in the video description if you want to check that out. But the takeaway is that if your CPU load is too high, you can reduce your PID loop frequency, you would go from 8K to 4K, that would cause the PID loop to run slower, and then you would have a lower CPU utilization. It's best to run the PID loop 
at the gyro update frequency if possible. There are subtle but real effects on the quadcopter's flight when the PID loop runs slower. If you need to slow it down, it's not the end of the world, and most people would probably never notice the difference, but if you can, you should run the PID loop at the same rate as the gyro update. Continue on down, we've got these three options to enable or disable the accelerometer, barometer, and magnetometer. And not all flight controllers are gonna have all of these sensors. All flight controllers are gonna have an accelerometer because it's built into the same chip that has the gyro and the quadcopter can't fly without the gyro. You can enable or disable the accelerometer. If you do disable the accelerometer, things like angle mode, horizon mode, and any other feature that require that relies on the accelerometer to tell the quadcopter which direction is up will stop working. Back in the old days, it was common to disable the accelerometer and that would reduce the CPU load very slightly on the old slow processors that we had. Today, our processors are really fast and there really isn't a compelling reason to disable the accelerometer uh, under most circumstances. The barometer sensor is used to detect altitude, probably don't have one, if you do, it turns out it's not that useful for very much. Betaflight doesn't do things like altitude hold. The only time the barometer would be used would be number one, in the on-screen display, you can have Betaflight show you at the altitude, and then you know what your approximate altitude above your takeoff location is. And the other thing is that if you have GPS rescue set up, Betaflight will, use, will, go, will go to a certain altitude when it tries to fly home, and the barometer can help increase the precision of that. You might think if you have a GPS unit, then you probably are fine because GPS also reports altitude. But it turns out that GPS is extremely inaccurate at reporting altitude. It's very good at reporting lateral position on the surface of the earth, but it's actually really imprecise when it comes to altitude. And if you really want accurate altitude, a barometer is, is recommended. And then a magnetometer is a compass and it shows you which direction you're facing relative to magnetic north. The craft name allows you to name your craft, JBQAVS. You can name it whatever you like. You can have the craft name show up in the on-screen display. Um, there is another parameter, pilot name, which can also show up in the OSD and for some reason is only accessible through the CLI. Betaflight devs should really add pilot name here as well. I don't know why it's not accessible through the through the GUI. A lot of people just use this for their call sign. Um, technically, craft name is supposed to be used for your aircraft. For example, when I try to save my configuration, uh, it will use my it will put my craft name in the file name, and then it would help. Because so if they if I just put put it as my pilot name, then all of my saved config files will just say JB, and it might be a little bit harder to figure out which quad they came from. So you can use craft name however you prefer. It's just a text string that will appear in your on-screen display and other places related to the name of the aircraft. FPV camera angle degrees is pretty difficult to explain. Um, I touched on this in the modes tab. The FPV camera angle degrees will automatically input yaw and roll to compensate for camera up tilt. So when you have the camera up tilted and you're flying forward and you're pitched forward at a certain angle, if you just put in yaw, the quad will rotate around its yaw axis, but not actually turn. And in order to turn, you have to put in both roll and yaw together. If you put in a non-zero number for FPV camera angle, the quadcopter will essentially subtract out that amount of camera tilt so that it feels like there's less camera tilt than there really is. So if you fly at an up tilt angle of say 25 degrees, if you then put in 25 degrees of FPV camera angle, inputting pure yaw would cause the quad to rotate as if it was flat and the flight controller would automatically input the correct amount of roll to cause the quad to rotate like this. The reason that FPV camera angle is not super useful for most people is that uh, it only compensates for a fixed up tilt angle. So if you put in 25 degrees of up tilt, but you're pitched way forward and you're at 45 degrees, you're still gonna have to put in the right amount of yaw and roll to coordinate the turn correctly. So the main place I think camera angle is useful is if you normally fly at 25 degrees, but for some reason, let's say you're, you're gonna go chase a race car and you need the quad to go faster. And so you've added a bunch of up tilt. So the camera's at 45 degrees. So you're flying with 20, 20 degrees more up tilt than you usually do. And you don't wanna like make your fingers adjust to the different amount of roll and yaw necessary to coordinate the turn. You could put in an up tilt angle of 20 and it would make that 45 degree up tilt feel 
like it was your normal 25 degree up tilt. It would subtract out 20 degrees of up tilt and then you could just use your regular muscle memory to fly the quad more like you usually do. Most experienced pilots don't use this and they just learn to manually correct for the amount of up tilt that's in the camera. Maximum arm angle. Uh, if the quadcopter is tilted past this maximum arm angle, it will refuse to arm. So the default is 25 degrees. And what that means if that is that if we are tilted more than 25 degrees in any direction, the quad will refuse to arm. The thinking behind this is that the quad will normally be flat and level on the ground when you're ready to take off. And if the quad is not flat and level on the ground, maybe you have it in your hands and you're like, oh, what am I going to do? And then, oh, I accidentally flicked the arming switch and now ah, it's eating my face. So the idea is that this is a safety, uh, safety mechanism. However, it's super annoying because if you set your quad down and your quad's just like resting on a rock or your quad's on a hill, if it's not the least bit flat and level, ah, it'll refuse to arm. So you could raise this number or what I do is I set it to 180 degrees, which completely disables it and allows you to arm at any, at any angle. If you do this, you should have some other safety mechanism to protect you against accidentally arming when the quadcopter is in your hands. But that's what I do on all my builds. Next, we're gonna talk about board and sensor alignment. And there is a common mistake that people make with this feature that I really wanna dispel. But before I do that, could you go down and hit the like button? It really helps the video succeed. Thanks so much. So the purpose of board and sensor alignment is that the flight controller needs to know which direction the front of the quadcopter is so that when you pitch forward, the flight controller makes the quadcopter pitch forward and not some other direction. And the fl all flight controllers will have a front facing arrow on them, which will indicate which direction the flight controller by default thinks is the front of the quadcopter. But there are often times when you have to mount the flight controller facing a different direction. Like for example, the wiring of the ESC may not be convenient based on the frame and the other stuff you're putting in the build. So you may have to rotate the ESC. And when you rotate the ESC, it's usually convenient to also rotate the flight controller to match. There are various reasons why you might not mount the flight controller facing forward. And if you do that, the board and sensor alignment is where you will tell the flight controller that it which direction is forward if it's not the default. Now, the common mistake that people make when they set this up is that they change the orientation of the gyro and the accelerometer, right? So for each gyro, some flight controllers will have more than one gyro chip. In this case, we only have one, right? We see there's only one here first, there's no second, but we have this alignment parameter here, which is set to clockwise 180. And this really illustrates the problem because most people assume that the correct orientation for the gyro is zero degrees. It's not rotated at all. Well, of course, that's what's correct. And that's not always true. So if you were to rotate the flight controller 180 degrees and you were to assume that meant that clockwise 180 was the correct orientation for the gyro, you would be wrong. Because for whatever reason, clockwise 180 is the correct orientation of this gyro chip when the flight controller is facing forward. And the actual purpose of this gyro alignment is for the manufacturer to tell the flight controller the orientation of the chip on the board. So for whatever reason, this manufacturer has installed this chip rotated 180 degrees. Maybe they did that because of the way the little traces, it made, made the traces easier to route. For, but for whatever reason, that's the default. Now you could try to work through the logic and go, okay, if forward is clockwise 180 and then I rotate it another 180 degrees, then the actual, don't do that. Just don't touch this option. Don't mess with it. Leave it at whatever the manufacturer set it to and use the board and sensor alignment parameters. These parameters rotate all the sensors on the whole board. They rotate the board itself rather than the, the sensor and they take into account anything else that might need to be modified. And that's the mistake people use is they use this option down here. It can work, but it doesn't always work. And these options, roll, pitch, and yaw degrees always work correctly. So how do we know if this is correct? What we do is we go to the setup tab and we hold the quadcopter up facing away from ourselves and flat and level. And then we click the reset Z axis button so that the 3D model 
also is sitting flat and level. And then we move the quadcopter with our hands and we tip the quadcopter forward and the 3D model tips forward. We tip the quadcopter back and the 3D model tips back. We tip it left and right and the 3D model moves correspondingly and we yaw it left and right and it all moves correctly. You have to do the checks on all three axes because depending on how you've oriented the flight controller within the frame, there are cases where like the pitch and the roll axis will be right but the yaw axis will be wrong. So if you only check two axes, then you may not get it right. Now let's imagine that I mounted this quadcopter in the frame. Uh, I'm going to make a really complex example. I'm going to just twist it upside down, backwards, left to right. Now the first thing you're going to notice is that it's upside down. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit calibrate accelerometer to tell the quadcopter the new direction that gravity is facing up. We're going to face it away from ourselves, and we're going to hit reset Z axis and we're going to check our rotation. Pitch forward is actually pitch back and yaw left and yaw uh, roll, roll left and roll right is correct and yaw is facing the opposite direction. So here's a little, a little tip. If yaw is facing the opposite direction, that means the board is flipped upside down. That means it's rotated 180 degrees either on the pitch or the roll axis. Since roll is correct, that means that it is correct on the pitch axis. It's flipped around the roll axis and that's why pitch is actually backwards. If you're not sure how to logic it out, I mean, you could just look at which direction you rotated it to figure out. But if you're not sure, you can just go into the configuration tab and start fiddling with things. So like, I know that my rotations are 180 degrees. I didn't rotate it 90 degrees because the USB is still coming out the side. So I know all my rotations are 180 degrees because the yaw axis is reversed. I know it's flipped upside down, either on pitch or roll. So let's put in 180 degrees of roll and see if that fixed anything. Go back to the setup tab, press reset Z axis. <gasps> yes, that, that fixed the pitch axis. Okay, that's good. How about the yaw axis? <gasps> that's great, the yaw axis correct. And the roll axis, oh my God, that was it. That's all we needed to do. Wonderful. Now you could imagine more complicated scenarios, like if for some reason you had an oddball frame where you had to rotate the, the, the flight controller 45 degrees. And those are gonna be a little harder to figure out because it's not just gonna like reverse the pitcher roll axis. It's gonna be some weird combination of them. But the bottom line is you need to look at how the flight controller has been rotated relative to its standard direction. And then you need to in, input those transformations here in the board and sensor alignment section. Now I told you previously that some flight controllers will have more than one gyro and accelerometer chip. This is my JBF7 flight controller, which has two gyros. And the advantage of this is that when you have two gyros, you can do a thing called sensor fusion that gives you cleaner gyro data and theoretically makes the quadcopter fly better. If your flight controller has multiple gyros, you will have the option here to tell Betaflight which gyro chip you want it to use. And you can set the orientation for each of the gyro chips. But again, you should just leave this at the manufacturer's default because if you screw this up, the quad won't fly right. You might think that you would always wanna use both gyros. After all, they gave you two. So of course you should use them. But sometimes you'll get a bad gyro. One of them will just fail because you crashed or it just came, it was bad from the factory or whatever. And if you've got a situation where your quadcopter is exhibiting symptoms of a bad gyro, then you can tell Betaflight, instead of using both gyros, just use the first one. And then if that turns out to be the bad one, you could say, just use the second one. And you could basically fail over to a single gyro. I've got a video about that and I'll put a link down in the video description if you wanna check that out. Finally, we've got mag alignment here, and this would be the alignment for the compass sensor. And it might surprise you that mag alignment is separate here from the other alignment. The reason for that is that Betaflight flight controllers basically never have a built-in compass. And the reason for that is that the flight controller itself and the ESC makes so much electrical noise that a, a magnetic compass would just be completely useless if it was built into the flight controller. The magnetometer is usually mounted separately on the quad, oftentimes as part of a GPS unit, and the orientation of the mag magnetometer depends on how you mount it. And so you just set that here. I've got a video I made a little while back about how to determine your magnetometer alignment. 
and which is correct. And I'll put a link to that down in the video description as well. Next up, let's look at accelerometer trim. And I told you previously that the accelerometer tells the flight controller which direction is up. And that is most commonly used for auto level mode. In auto level mode or angle mode, as they call it in beta flight, when you center the stick, the quadcopter returns to level. And for the most part, this means that it stays still, although it's not a true position hold which requires more sophisticated programming and GPS sensors at the very least. But the problem is that when we calibrate the accelerometer here, it doesn't perfectly tell the flight controller what direction is up. It gets it pretty close, but like your table may not be perfectly level or the flight controller might not be perfectly flat within the frame, or there may be just some weight imbalance, which means that when the flight controller is perfectly level, the quad still tends to drift in a given direction. And, the, and for that purpose, Betaflight supports a feature called accelerometer trim. Now you can input accelerometer trim here in the configurator by in inputting a negative or a positive number for pitch and roll. And that'll be roll left and right, pitch forward and back. But that's not how you should probably do it. There's a way to do it in flight where you use the sticks to trim out the accelerometer. I've got a tutorial about how to do that and I'll put a link down in the video description if you wanna check it out. But the bottom line is that almost always, if you're using auto level modes, you will wanna take the time to trim out your accelerometer and you'll see these numbers be at some non-zero value and that will tell you what the trim values are. By the way, resist the temptation to trim the accelerometer using trim switches on your radio because that may make the quadcopter hover flat in angle mode, but it'll screw up the flight characteristics in acro mode. And of course you don't want that unless you like literally never fly in acro mode. That's still not a good idea. Next up, the D-Shot beacon configuration. So here's the problem. Quadcopters need to have beepers. It's super convenient for quadcopters to have beepers because then when you lose your quadcopter because you crashed it in a bush and you can't find it, you can make it go beep, 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 and then you can find it, right? But many quadcopters don't have beepers because, well, maybe there's no room to put one on or maybe you just didn't have one when you built the quad. So what do you do? Betaflight has the ability to beep the motors instead of a physical beeper. And the motors are capable of beeping. Of course, when you plug in, they go do 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 do. The motors are actually what's making that sound. There's no speaker on the quad. Uh, and so if you enable D-Shot beacon configuration, then Betaflight will use the motors as a beeper instead of the, or in addition to the built-in beeper. You have two choices here. One is for RX lost, which will cause the motors to begin beeping when you fail safe. And one is for RX set, which will cause the motors to beep when you use the beeper aux mode. You also have the option to change the beeper tone. One, two, three, four, five. There are five different sort of sounds. Uh, I like sound number one. It's just like a simple beep, beep, beep. Some people feel that two, three, four, or five is a little bit more audible. I personally find them annoying. You can just change those settings and beep your motors and see which one you like the best. One last thing about this option is you do have to be using D-Shot. If for some reason you're not using D-Shot, and I don't know why that would be, but if for some reason you're not using D-Shot, then this option won't be there. Well, as long as we're talking about the beeper, let's get this beeper configuration section out of the way. This allows you to tell Betaflight which conditions you want it to beep for or which conditions you don't want it to beep for. And if you feel that your quadcopter is beeping all the time when you don't want it to, you can turn these things off. One of the best ones to turn off is the USB option, which on most flight controllers will cause it to stop beeping when you're plugged into USB and working on the quadcopter on the bench. Um, not all flight controllers support the ability to detect that the quadcopter is powered from USB, but most of them do. And I like to turn this option off on all of my builds. Next, let's move over to the other features, more commonly just known as features in the configuration tab. Uh, and we'll just run through these and I'll tell you what each of them are. The OSD feature means that Betaflight will show the on-screen display in your goggles. It'll show things like battery voltage and artificial horizon and other information in your goggles when you are flying. This works with analog video transmitters and cameras on most flight controllers. And in some cases, it also is used with HD0 and DJI. Anytime you want the flight controller to participate in creating an on-screen display in your goggles, you need the OSD feature turned on. It'll be on by default for almost all flight controllers that you'll buy today. And there's really not a compelling reason to ever turn it off 
that I can think of. The air mode feature goes back to the air mode aux mode that we talked about in the previous video about aux modes. Um, to recap, air mode increases the stability of the quadcopter when you are at zero throttle. Now, if you enable the air mode feature, then air mode will be permanently enabled all of the time. And many people prefer to fly this way. However, some people like the ability to switch air mode on and off. And I'll tell you why in just a second. But if you want the ability to switch air mode on and off, you would turn air mode off in the features tab and we'll save and reboot. And then you could go to the modes tab and you will find a new mode there, which I didn't cover in my aux modes video because that feature was enabled, air mode. And you can add an aux mode range to allow you to switch air mode on and off with a switch. So why would you want to do that? The main reason that people don't like air mode is that if air mode is on, and you touch an object, like you're trying to perch, like Mr. Steel likes to perch on top of something and just sort of sit there for a second and then fly away. Or Drew, Drew Ladrib likes to slide on the pavement and grind, right? If you have air mode turned on, when you do that, as you touch down, the quad will bounce back up again and react in a strong way. And so if you're going to do perches and slides and grinds, you may want to turn air mode off using a switch before you do those moves and turn it back on again when you're flying. But if you don't commonly do those moves, my recommendation is to turn it on here in the features section and just have it be permanently enabled. The transponder feature goes back to the question of how do you time races? And today, the way that race timing systems work is they detect the video transmitter signal and they time the quadcopter passing through the gate based on the strength of the video transmitter signal, which is convenient because basically everybody with a racing drone has a video transmitter on their drone. But before that technology was developed, uh, quadcopters would have an infrared LED emitter installed facing out the sides, and there would be an infrared LED detector at the timing gate and that transponder would trigger the detector and that's how they did race timing. That's what this feature is for and you're probably never going to use it because if you are racing, people are doing VTX-based timing. They're not using those infrared transponders anymore, but that's what it is. Channel forwarding is used to forward some of your aux channels to servo outputs on the flight controller. And the main, like, imagine that you want to have a switch on your controller that causes a servo to move, like to drop a balloon. It's commonly called a bomb drop, although in today's world where people are very concerned about that kind of thing, we should probably stay away from that term. If you, um, what if you wanted to have a camera that tilted up and down and you wanted to use one of the sliders on the side of your controller to tilt that camera up and down? You would need to output one of your aux channels to that servo. And if you were going to do that, you would enable the channel forwarding feature in Betaflight. That, there's more that you need to do to set that feature up and it involves the servo tab which you can see right here. I've got a tutorial about how to set that up and I'll put a link in the video description if you're interested. It's fairly complicated and it's not worth going into any further in this video. The display option. Uh, Betaflight has the ability to attach a small OLED screen. So when you're in the field and you wanna mess with your Betaflight configuration, instead of doing it in your laptop, you do it on this screen. If you were using that feature, you would enable this option. Most people aren't doing that and most people won't use this option. LED strip would be enabled if you had programmable LEDs. This is common because they look cool, but also uh, a lot of times in races, like specifically the Tiny Trainer spec race requires you to have LEDs on the quad so that they have different colors. I've got a tutorial about how to set up LED strip as well. I'll link it down in the video description, of course. The telemetry feature is enabled if your receiver protocol has telemetry. I talked about this previously in the receiver tab, so we don't need to go into it in any further depth, but you would always wanna have this on if you were using any telemetry-based features. The sonar feature is used Used if you have a sonar sensor, a downward facing sonar sensor that is used to tell the altitude, the height of the uh, quadcopter above the ground. However, I am pretty sure that Betaflight doesn't actually use this sensor for anything because Betaflight hasn't had an altitude hold mode in I can't remember how long. And so I'm pretty sure that even though for some reason Betaflight still has support for sonar sensor, there's no reason to actually use it because it doesn't actually do anything with that 
In fact, we do have a sonar sensor up here, but like literally there's no altitude hold mode. I don't know what it would use a sonar for. The soft serial feature is used to increase the number of UARTs that you have. So imagine we go to the ports tab and this flight controller has a, like a huge number of UARTs, more UARTs than we'll probably ever need. But on some flight controllers, especially like tiny whoop flight controllers, there may be only two or three UARTs. And then maybe you've got a GPS unit that you want to solder up or a video transmitter that you want to solder up and you don't have a spare UART for it. If you set up the soft serial feature, you can turn some of your spare pads into a, an extra UART. I've got a tutorial about how to set this up. I will link it in the video description, but that's when you would enable this. When you've run out of UARTs in the ports tab, but you have a few spare like motor outputs that you're not using. Your, your flight controller supports eight motor outputs, but you're only using a quadcopter. So you can turn some of those motor outputs into an extra UART. That's what soft serial is. Servo tilt is used if you have your camera mounted on a pitch and roll servo. And if you enable servo tilt and then do some other setup that we're not gonna go into in this video, then it will automatically stabilize the camera as the quadcopter pitches back and forth and rolls left and right. It's kind of cool, but it's not commonly used on racing and freestyle drones because it adds a lot of weight and compromises durability. And then lastly, we have the in-flight accelerometer calibration option. If you enable this option, it allows you to calibrate your accelerometer while you are flying. In the tutorial I showed you previously, uh, when we talked about accelerometer roll and trim, you would land the quadcopter and, and manually input some stick commands to calibrate it. Once you enable it, there will be an additional mode here, Calib, and if you set that mode up with a switch, then you can activate that mode and while that mode is active, you use your sticks to hover the quadcopter and then you release that mode and it trims the accelerometer to wherever your sticks were holding it. Some people like that, but personally having to set up a mode and do all this configuration seems like a little tedious thing. It would be a cool way if you regularly had to recalibrate your accelerometer in the field, like because your weight balance, you were constantly putting a big camera on the front of your quad or taking it off and it's constantly throwing your accelerometer calibration out of whack. You could set up this aux mode and you could set up the in-flight ACC cal feature so that you could easily trim out your accelerometer in the field simply by doing a hover and flicking a switch. Next, we come to the GPS section. And when we enable the GPS section, we see a few additional options here. By the way, in order to enable this and use this, you also need to configure the GPS here in the ports tab. And you would need to set one of your, uh, sorry, one of your sensor inputs to be GPS. Back in the configuration tab, the GPS options include the GPS protocol. There are two options here, uh, three actually, <laughs> two that are commonly used though, NMEA and U-Blocks. And almost all GPSs that you're gonna buy today will support U-Blocks. The only real reason to use NMEA is if your U GPS didn't support U-Blocks, but since most uh, GPSs today do support U-Blocks, you should use U-Blocks. And the reason you should use U-Blocks is that U-Blocks supports automatic configuration of the GPS unit. So there are various parameters that the GPS unit and the flight controller need to agree on. And if they don't, then it won't work. With NMEA, you have to set those parameters manually. With U-Blocks, you enable auto baud and you enable auto config, and then it just takes care of it automatically. And although I'm not like a super expert on GPS enabled quads, the people who are, like Pavel Spikowski from the INAV development and other people who do a lot of flying with GPS, say in general, the best advice is enable U-Blocks, enable Autobot, enable Auto Config, and then when you do that, if your GPS is wired up correctly, you should see the GPS icon here at the top of the screen turn yellow, indicating that the flight controller is talking to the GPS. Now, some people have argued that switching from U-Blocks to NMEA has resulted in faster updates faster refresh of the GPS. I don't know if that's true, but I do want to report that some people have said that. Some people have also pointed out that if you disable AutoBaud and then you go in the ports tab and you manually set the baud rate, that the GPS will initialize faster. It will, it'll, it'll start up faster a little bit. Um, that may be true but if you don't know what the correct baud rate is for your GPS, then you're kind of out of luck. This use Galileo option 
uh, should basically always be turned on. It uses additional uh, satellites to increase the precision and increase the lock, the number of satellites locked. And I don't think there's really any reason to turn it off. And then finally, we've got the set home point once option. Uh, and the way that Betaflight determines its GPS home point is when you first power up, there is no home point. And you'll notice that when you first power up, the direction home arrow is just a dash. And then as soon as you arm the quad, that becomes the new home point uh, for the direction home, the distance home. And if you do return to home, that's where it will fly to. Now, the default way that Betaflight works is if you land during flight and then rearm the quad, that becomes the new home point. But if you enable the set home once option, only the first arming after power up is the home point. If you subsequently land and take off again, it does not set a new home point. So you can decide which of these matches your sort of mission profile. Lastly, we've got the ground assistance type here. And ground assistance is a set of terrestrial broadcasts that can improve the precision of GPS units. Um, ground assistance may or may not be present in your area. Like it, I think it's most present in urban environments where GPS signals may get corrupted and they'll put extra sensors like uh, up on buildings and stuff or cell towers. I don't really, I don't actually really know. But the general advice that I've seen is to set ground assistance type to auto detect. There isn't a really a downside to having it on that I'm aware of. And if you know where you'll be flying, you can choose the region that you're in, but also you could just choose auto detect and leave it there. Well, as long as we're talking about GPS, I feel like we should get the GPS tab out of the way because there's actually no configurable options in this tab. It's just a tab for you to see what GPS data Betaflight is seeing at this moment. And at this moment, we're just dealing with a naked flight controller on the table and we're indoors. So even if we did have a GPS, we wouldn't actually be getting any satellites locked or anything. But if you've got a GPS unit and you wanna see how many sats Betaflight has locked, what satellites it's seeing. And if you have internet access, it'll load a map here and show your current GPS location. This is a great place to do that. This is useful for troubleshooting your GPS unit when you're not getting a lock. But remember, the first thing you should check is that you have a yellow GPS icon here at the top of the configurator, meaning the flight controller is talking to the GPS unit. And then you set it outside for five or 10 minutes and see if it gets a lock and you see, you know, try and figure out what's going on there. This isn't really a video about troubleshooting GPS, so we're not gonna go in any more depth there, but that's the GPS tab. I think next we'll just work our way down this, uh, down this list and we'll go to the power and battery tab where we'll see some options for configuring the uh, battery voltage and the, the amps or milliamp hours that the flight controller is detecting. But there are some quirks here in setting this stuff up that a lot of people don't know about. You'll have to watch the next video in order to get that. There's a card on screen once that video comes out uh, and a card here for the whole playlist if you wanna go back and check out all the videos in this series. Thanks so much for watching. Happy flying.